Thanks, you guys. Um, so I'm going to move out the, th the third chair, but I'll ask uh, Philip Schmidt from the MIT Media Lab, who just this week announced the Public Library Innovation Exchange, which he'll tell us about. Um, and Jocelyn Kennedy from right here at Harvard, the executive director of the Harvard Law Library, um, to bring us home. You guys, you guys should go where you want. I'll get out of the way. So I'm just going to take this one. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get a moderator. We also got very little instruction. And so, so we started shooting emails back and forth, saying, here's, here's what I'm interested in. And then an email came back. And, I think after listening to the previous panels, there are two areas that, that still stand out for me that I would love to talk to you about and also talk about myself a little bit. Um, one is this relationship between uh, virtual and face-to-face. -face. Uh, came up in the first panel. It's kind of what is the role of a virtual or a digital library? What is the role of the, the place? And then the other one is, um, and maybe we start there, is the library as a platform. So partnerships with uh, journalists or other kinds of organizations. And I know there's a, um, a library innovation lab here at Harvard, uh, and you're working with public libraries and I think also academic libraries, and so I'm curious, and we have this public library innovation exchange, so maybe we, should get, we could just share some experiences. Sure. Do you want to go first? Do you want to no, no, I've already been talking for you. No, you go, you go first. But you have such a lovely voice. Um, so we do, we have an innovation lab here, and I think that's, um, we've worked with vendors, we've worked with lots of other people to get content. It's a really interesting, we're working with BPL right now to get some of our, uh, to have a shared digital collection, which I think is going to be amazing, and some other academic libraries as well. One of the things that you had emailed me about, that's a question that I'm interested in talking about, I think, was sort of, what is the role of an academic library in relation to the public library? And of course, I shot back, like, where do we live in the digital space? So um, I'm gonna could I answer your question about sort of where I see academic libraries and, and public libraries? I'm not in charge. And then I want to talk to you about, well, we're, but we're having this conversation. I don't want to ask you something you don't want to answer. Um, and then I, I'm interested to hear from you sort of what's happening at the Media Lab, because I think that's a really interesting um, project, the work that you're doing there. So um, the question about what can academic libraries do with public libraries is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I'm a passionate believer in public libraries, and lots of people tell me that I, they think I'm a public librarian. I've never actually worked in a um, non-academic public library, which is weird. Um, I probably should be doing that. So I, I think there's a huge role for academic libraries in relation to public libraries in a couple of areas. And the one that I'm sort of really passionate about right now is sort of thinking about how we help young people um, in libraries sort of come to academia, right? How do we help there's a huge role for academic libraries to play in public libraries. I would love to send my librarians into public libraries to work with public librarians and to work with um, all library patrons because they're future college attendees, right, regardless of their age, um, to help them learn how to use resources, to think about information literacy, to think about what Mary's talking about, about media literacy, to think about what the world looks like beyond their small space. Um, I think that's one area where we can help. And then the innovation lab, sort of as we're, we're looking at ways that we can extend information out to the public. So uh, one of our big projects right now, and I'm pointing to Jack Cushman because it's one of the things he's going to be working on and has been working on, is the Case Law Access Project, which I'm sure lots of you have heard about, where we've digitized um, all of the case law of the United States of America, but the next piece of it is like, now that we've done that, what do we do with that information? It's not simply enough to have digitized the content. We're extending access, and what does that mean? And there's lots of different ways to consider that. Um, one is from an academic standpoint, so that re researchers can manipulate and look at ontologies um, and things like that. I'm seriously interested in how we use that information to help a 14-year-old kid who lives on a reservation in the middle of America provided that Susan Crawford does her good work and gets him, inter him or her internet access, is trying to help their parent with a legal issue, right? Or a child, I'm sort of very focused on younger people, a child who um, is the only native English speaker in their family who's helping um, with an eviction problem or something. So those are some ways that 
um, I think we can enter that public library space. Yeah, and in some ways, um, I think this experience you've had with between academic libraries and public libraries, at the Media Lab, we had this hypothesis that there would be a connection between Media Lab students and public libraries. And we um, uh, essentially reached out to the Media Lab community and said, uh, we're building this relationship with public libraries. We already have a relationship with some of the leading ones in the US. And we'd like to hear who's interested in working with public libraries. And the response has been kind of almost overwhelming. Uh, and so uh, actually my colleague Catherine, who's sitting in the back there, and I, who are running this project, um, we uh, brought on board a librarian, because we're not librarians. And we wanted to make sure that we really understand that perspective, someone from the MIT library uh, who came on board with the project. And then we started talking to the libraries about what are the kinds of programs or services would they be interested in uh, developing with someone from the Media Lab. And we started talking to the Media Lab uh, folks, uh, saying, what are you working on? And is there a, a connection to public libraries? And what we heard uh, from many of them is, you know, we at, and I think probably many of you have a sense of what the Media Lab does. We're about three or 400 people. We build a, a, a lot of technology. We're very technology and innovation focused. And for many of our students, it turned out the, most, uh, the thing that they were most interested in with public libraries is getting closer to the communities, getting closer to real people, uh, uh, working with an institution that's trusted in the community so that they could then, we use the term deploy, but it's really more co-develop their technologies with these communities to make sure that they actually make sense, that people want to use them, that they get value out of them. And so we've been uh, kind of matching up these researchers with public libraries, and we're excited to do some things that I think haven't necessarily been done a lot in libraries before, including uh, building a CubeSat satellite that's going to get launched into space and send back data, uh, or doing learning research where actually the librarians and the media lab researchers together do the research. So the library becomes a, a place of research uh, rather than just uh, getting programs from vendors or, or outside partners. So, I think this, this kind of this interface between innovators and, and new types of partners and, and public libraries is really interesting. And, and uh, what, yeah, I think the media lab is just, I think you, we, we're just the beginning of, of this, right? Like there are lots of other organizations that I think we should try to get involved um, into this. Isn't it interesting how, um, how excited librarians are to be learners? Have you found that interesting? Uh, I mean, they are like the the they they are the learners, right? Uh, so we love working with them because uh, they are so curious. But also, they are. Um, I think in the media lab, sometimes because we put technology first or often first, right? We kind of like run ahead with this technology, and we have found that the librarians are certain bring kind of a a thoughtfulness, a groundedness into the conversation that also has for us has been really really uh, amazing pulls in the balance between that sort of push towards innovation and, and and a little bit maybe more, the word that's coming to my head is sensibility, and I don't mean that pejoratively towards innovators, right? But there is some sensibility when you're building something for a space. Is it really going to work? When we have that big vision of what it could be, does it actually fit within whatever the, the box or the parameters of the actual people are? So that's... I'm excited. We should talk more about what we could do together. Um, so yes. you said something about what, I, what I'm really interested in is this notion of community. Like I'm, I'm thrilled to know that your, um, that your students are really wanting to get close to the community. So I think one of the reasons why John asked me to talk here is because I'm fascinated that the role the digital public library can play in community. And I think you're a little bit skeptical of the virtual community. I don't want to speak for you, but let me say my thing. Say, okay? say your thing. I'm going to say my thing, which is that I grew up in a town with a thousand people. Um, there were 600 families. I can speak very clearly to what it's like to live in a rural community um, and the role that a rural <coughs> community library plays in being a news provider, absolutely, in 1980. Um, and so I think about public libraries very much from the rural standpoint. A lot of times when we think about public libraries, I think we think about urban spaces, right? And that's where people can get to libraries. 56% of communities in the United States do not have libraries in them. 
Um, there's 19,000 incorporated communities in the United States as of 2015. In 2012, there were 9,000 public libraries. So right, we're not meeting the need. And so what I think about is like, what do we do for those other 10,000 communities, right? What, where do those people go to get um, the experience, whether in person or maybe it's virtually, to launch a rocket into space, to sort of participate in this launching of a satellite, to be in a maker space, um, to have community and connection. Uh, and more personally, I have a 22-year-old child who has severe social anxiety, and so going into a physical space is not really possible for them. And so the experience that lots of kids and other members of our community get who have access to public libraries are actually closed to broad swaths of our community. So how can, and so my child has found this space online, these amazing communities um, of people and connection, and it is, has replicated the experience of being in a physical space online. And, and I, so I have a lot of curiosity about what is the role that the digital public library can, can play in places like the Media Lab, places like the Library Innovation Lab here at Harvard to, to actually extend community, not just information, because I think, yes, what we do as libraries providing information is super important. It's like the bread and butter of our business, right? This is why we have this huge building was for all the books, but you walk through, you see we have less books, more people, right? It's about community and it's about connection. And I'm really concerned about the 56% of our communities in the United States who don't have access to that kind of community. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, and I, I, I agree. It's, I think um, it's kind of interesting how I got to the point where I am because I started being almost uh, like I would introduce myself as I am from the internet uh, because I was so um, optimistic about this new world where we would all connect with each other and speak across boundaries and solve problems together through collaboration. And before I came to the Media Lab, I co-founded a um, nonprofit called Peer-to-Peer -Peer University. And what we tried to do is, is exactly this, bring people together online where they could study things that they were interested in in these virtual communities using open educational resources and Skype and, and these technologies. And we kind of ended up with a similar frustration because we couldn't reach the people who weren't already uh, highly educated, had reliable access, and knew how to navigate this, this online world. So for us then, the face-to-face -face starting to work with public libraries, we made a huge shift a few years ago where now we work exclusively with physical spaces where people get together. They still take the online courses. We still benefit from the resources that exist online. But that face-to-face -face interaction, especially for the audience we were trying to reach, was so valuable um, that we, we kind of made this shift. But I haven't fully given up on my idealistic hope. And I mean, the reason why I got so uh, en enchanted with the internet back in those days was because you could make these connections with other people. You would find community online in a way that I think I hadn't quite anticipated, right? Like we are so used to finding community in the physical spaces that you could make these deep connections in an entirely digital space. For me, it was was incredible. So I think maybe, we're coming through this, okay, I was online only, now we're online and offline, and like hopefully, and maybe that's a role that the DPLA could or should play, is how do we build these strong communities and, and small groups where people support each other who are only going to be interacting with each other online. What else do you want us to talk about, John? <laughs> are, we're doing okay? Yes? Yes. I know your library's awesome. And we're actually one of those I brought up the food shop because we just had a meeting yesterday with uh, with somebody from the media lab and Dana Wilson and they'll never see the name Center for Actresses. And we're gonna be working on that public component. So we're really actually delighted to be collaborating with you. Th Thank you so much. Um, no, we're, we are super excited about this. And w the thing that we're um, still grappling with a little bit is, um, so the CubeSat project is amazing, right? Like kids are going to get to build a, so if, uh, CubeSats are these tiny 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter little things 
that you can uh, include in the um, payload for a, a rocket that goes into space. So it's like a, kind of a standardized size. And you can also stick them together so you can build larger satellites. And they're, you know, they're real satellites. They get tested, they get, they're you know, space worthy. And so we're extremely excited to be uh, doing some of those CubeSat developments. But then what we are also asking is, how do we make that experience accessible to maybe hundreds or thousands of public libraries? Because they're not all going to build a CubeSat, right? Like, you need access to people who can help with the construction and the design. You need some funding. You know, it's, it's, uh, building the device isn't that expensive, but actually getting it to the launch gets very expensive with all the testing and the actual... Uh, payload you have to pay for. So for us, kind of, this is a great experiment to, to do a very high fidelity version that we would like to do with more libraries. But we're also thinking about, well, how can we do this in a thousand libraries? Right. Because they're not all going to build a CubeSat. Um, and, and I'd love, if anyone has any suggestions or ideas, um, I'd love to hear those. Um, well, maybe it's a, it's a question for the room a little bit. So, because um, I, I totally agree, yeah, I think you said it, uh, this is the moment, let's seize the moment, this is the moment for libraries. That's exactly how I feel. And I also see the same enthusiasm in our Media Lab students. Right? People are really, there's something magical about the public library, there's something in the air right now that people are really excited about. But I'm a little bit worried that we're leaning more and more on the public library to provide all of the social services that actually should be provided by other institutions, and we're not shifting the resources that those other institutions had in the past. So I, I, I'm a little worried about us being so, too excited about public libraries only because they're kind of the last institution left. Um, and I, I wonder if that's something others are concerned about or have thoughts on. Well, then I think that gets to your point of sort of what can academic libraries, what can other institutions, I mean, I'm sort of keeping it within the library sphere. I do think there's other institutions that need to participate in this. But I, I think that's to your point of what can academic libraries um, contribute. So we... It's hard to say this when you're at Harvard, but we have money issues too, right? Like li all, I know, all libraries have funding issues. There are a limited amount of resources available, but there are um, community members who can go help. So in one way, I think academic libraries can be more, as I said before, be more present in the physical space of the public library is one aspect. And to try to build everything that we build to have it be open access and extendable to public libraries so that they can lean on some of our resources. We can do things at broader scale. So if we're buying space um, on the cloud, maybe we buy a little extra space um, and we let public libraries use that space and that enables some of that sort of innovation and to happen in the public library, um, which would be a light lift for us, I think. That's a really good idea. Uh, so I think I might have just committed myself to that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll go in with you. Yeah, we could do yeah, it together, we'll do it right? Together. That's yeah. sort of, that feels like a low lift. Or, or we'll convince John to do it with the digital public library. So there you go, yeah. No, I'm, we're on the hook. What do other people we're, we'll think? We'll help. What do other people think? I see a lot of nodding. I'm Ahmad Hazra, I'm a, facu uh, a faculty at the School of Information in Kent State in Ohio and a fellow at Berkman this year. Um, I um, just got a, a IMLS grant to bring AI to public libraries. I'm a data analytics for uh, supporting local communities. Um, I am a data scientist more than a librarian, but I'm sitting in a library. And it is fantastic when I hear this, one of the ideas that we had in that Right. It's thinking from an innovation ecology perspective that how bigger players, they have a lot of capacity, but they might not get involved in sort of tasks that it is usually uh, designated to smaller players. So if you look at the uh, innovation ecology perspective, if you pass those capabilities to smaller players, the innovation will increase in the community. And I believe that's an excellent idea. If you have cloud computing support and you can share it with public libraries, that is fantastic. Uh, last week we had a kickoff meeting. We brought four uh, public library system people and talked with them. They are so thrilled to learn these new skills, so thrilled to get some of these supports. Uh, and understand how they can use that. So I think this is fantastic if you can partnership and pass some of these capabilities to uh, local public libraries. And, and I, I, 
am very um, uh, uh, persuaded that this is going to help improve innovation in local level and, and, and in different, you know, covering in different ages from high school and even people who are going to start to small businesses or entrepreneurs. Do you want to respond? Sure. Uh, yeah, what you said. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that's really interesting. I'm fascinated by it. I would love to have like a conversation with you offline about sort of the notion of artificial intelligence in public libraries. And part of me feels like a creepy Amazon thing about that. And then part of me thinks, wow, that's really interesting. And what could we do in an artificial intelligence space um, in public libraries? And, and I would love to figure out with you, if you want to have a conversation, and figure out other ways that libraries can work together and we can find these, transferring that information downward, I think is really interesting. What do you think about that? I agree. Uh, and actually, do you have a website or something that you want to share with people? Uh, it's next.io uh, with a K. So it's a knowledge extension, but we call it next with a K. And um, actually the domain bought three days ago. It's going to be up next week. Great. Ne next week with a K also? <laughs> Somebody else had their hand up. John Bracken had his hand up. <laughs> so this is building off the conversation we had last week about family. Yeah. Um, you know, so, okay, so Second Life didn't really work out, but there were a lot of library, librarians hanging out there, and there's some librarians who are still hanging out there, uh, <laughs> successfully, and, you know, and it is still a legitimate space, right, that people are using. I don't know if it's a Second Life experience, um, and I don't think this, this is a five-year or ten-year proposition, um, but I can imagine a space that is really active and engaged. I watch young people and the way that they um, are creating these amazing spaces for themselves online outside of the commercial social media paradigm um, where they are building these connections. And maybe the library is not, it might be that the library is not the entity that creates those kinds of communities but I think it's worth exploring because right now libraries are creating these really amazing communities for people um, who don't have access, right? I don't know how much time you see, uh, I think everybody here is a library fan, but how much time do you spend, unless you're in uh, a public library, just watching people in the public library and how they use that space um, and the amazing ways that human connection is happening. So, uh, so, so I would challenge the, the digital public library to sort of think about where is the human intersection online? What could it possibly look like um, today, tomorrow, 15 years from now? That is building that richness of human connection because I don't, because I, as much as I think face to face connection is important, it's not possible for a lot of people um, for a number of reasons. Um, and, f you know, again, we talked, let's talk to Susan Crawford and help her with the fiber issue, right? So we have to make sure people have connection because my rural kid doesn't get helped unless my rural kid has access to the internet. But setting that problem aside, how do, I, don't, I don't know exactly how you build it, but I imagine it's being an amazing, magical space. Um, yeah, and I'd, I completely agree. And I'd add one uh, that's much less interesting and more boring, but I think also still important, which is um, this idea of open content or open resources. Uh, it's like that was a big topic 10 years ago. Everyone got very excited about that. And I feel like there's kind of a waning enthusiasm. Like people are just don't think that's particularly interesting anymore. And um, when you look at the resources that exist, and w when I say uh, there's a waning interest, not from me and not from my friends, but I think in general, because um, I see Wendy in the back there kind of. Uh, um, <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, but I think there's still, um, 
there's a real threat to the public domain, to openly licensed uh, content, and I feel there's less public attention and enthusiasm to take on those those issues. And I feel I, I would hope that the uh, Digital Public Library um, of America or the Americas uh, can can cannot take their eye off of that and make sure that we we retain kind of a focus on making sure that those resources are available. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, don't pivot all the way away from content, right? Because that rural kid also needs access to the magical world of books and information, right? Because that's going to unlock a lot of things for those kids, too. Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Wendy Seltzer, and uh, I'll, uh, as a copyright lawyer, one of the things I love about libraries is that you know if they didn't exist, you'd be really, really hard pressed to invent them today. <laughs> Physical places that just give out books for to anyone who walks in and lend them out with barely any proof the who you are and that you could pay for all of the content that you're getting access to for free. I mean, it's fantastic, uh, and so I see. Uh, uh, I, I love libraries for, for that role and for their roles as guardians of free speech and anonymity. And, and I think uh, expanding on that concept of what are these other non-rival resources that we can help gain, give people access to uh, as a commons. Um, and let, let's uh, renew that imagination too of what are other resources or the places where people are being asked to identify themselves libraries can be a shield from uh, identity by uh, geolocation and IP address and internet connection uh, the places where people are being asked to sort of prove something about themselves the library can give them a spot from which to do that Maybe we have time for one more contribution or question. That's a heavy burden. Um, I'm Jenny Rose Helper, and I work at Creative Commons. Obviously, I also still care, as pr probably everybody in this room, still care about openly licensed content. Um, I have a question about um, that in particular and what academic libraries can bring to public libraries. Um, at Harvard, for example, at MIT, you have access to huge repositories, huge databases of materials that are sometimes assigned, that it sometimes have to be found by people in public libraries. And I'm wondering, you know, how can academic libraries take these huge open access initiatives like the one at MIT, like Dash at Harvard, and like the other Harvard open access initiatives, and how can they um, use sort of that energy that is still happening within libraries and um, bring that energy to public libraries in particular um, so that librarians uh, don't have to respond, no, I'm sorry, we don't have access to that resource. No, I'm sorry, you can only see an EBSCO snippet. Uh, no, I'm sorry, you can only see the abstract of this PubMed article. How can um, you know, the riches of these huge repositories that are you know, largely commercial uh, be brought to public libraries? <laughs> uh, well, I'm loath to answer that question as our university librarian is sitting in front of me, Sarah Thomas, and Suzanne Wones is in the back of the room, who is a, the Harvard Library Digital Strategy Librarian, um, and Francisca Frey, who's the Chief of Staff of the Harvard Libraries, and I cannot speak on behalf of Harvard at all in that context. I mean, I think that, that um, your question about how you extend out information that is stuck behind paywalls, so much of our content is stuck behind paywalls. It's a huge issue. And in academic libraries, we're, our hands are tied in lots of ways because we need to get that content to our patrons. Um, Academic libraries are trying to work with publishers um, to try and help them see their way toward more open access content um, that does not delegitimize their need to make a profit. Uh, so it's kind of a weird balance for some of those companies to be in. Um, you know, we continue to digitize what we can. I uh, think we sort of intellectually lean pretty heavily on Brewster at the Internet Archive 
who is really seems to be prepared to take it on the chin with the publishers um, to make his content of to make content available that is in copyright, and so I think those are some ways. I'm not answering your question uh, because it's a hard question to answer. We're restricted by licenses. It's all about money, right? And so. I mean, quite honestly, right now, what I'm trying to do is get vendors to make their content that I have to buy and restrict be accessible to people who have different abilities. And I'm, you know, I'll take up the open access thing after I can make sure that a blind person can actually get access to all of the information that we subscribe to. Uh, since nobody from MIT is here, I can... Uh, <laughs> 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 so we're going to make everything... No. Um, uh, uh, I, I think... Um, well, one is I liked in the earlier conversation um, the charge to the DPLA to be more of an activist and kind of take on the, the thorny issues. And I think institutions like MIT, or at least the Media Lab, would be happy to be allies in that, right? So uh, maybe we wouldn't be the one that makes the first step, but I think we'd want to be part of a club that, that kind of takes on those issues. Um, I think internally we have a responsibility to just make sure everything we produce is openly licensed and accessible and reachable. Um, and so at the Media Lab we do have a pretty good open uh, access policy that applies both to uh, research publications and uh, software. So the default is open source. Um, and I think CC BY uh, for, for publications. Um, we can probably do more in, in terms of doing that for all of MIT, but I know Chris Bork, who isn't here, the MIT librarian, is very active uh, in that space and really trying to push the institute to do more. Um, and I think we have a responsibility to be a, kind of a leader, right? Like as we did with OpenCourseWare, um, which really opened the floodgates for universities to say, oh, all, they realized that the content wasn't the most valuable thing about going to a, a university. And then they started uh, making their content available. I think in the same way, we should be more of a leader again and, and kind of uh, do the same thing in the online course space, for example, where many of the MOOCs, which are called massive open online courses, are actually not open at all. Uh, the materials are not openly licensed. When the course has run, you can't access it anymore. Um, but um, I know Griff had a question, but I, I just got the signal, so maybe we can, uh, yeah, I got the, um, there's also, also we're the, like, in the, we're the only thing between them and that. Uh, oh, you are, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I'll be brief and just, I guess, say three things since I am between you and, and, the, and Harvard's alcohol. Um, first, I want to, where did she go? One, another one of my board members just walked in. Jenny, where did you go? I just saw you. Jenny Lee is also here. I introduced the other board members a minute ago. Um, second, I want to acknowledge the DPLA staff who are here, who have been here longer than I have. Ariel, who's taking notes right now and working. Michael and Michelle are all here, and I hope if you don't know them, you'll get a chance to know them. And third, I want to thank the Berkman folks in particular, Harvard in general, and Berkman in particular, especially Alba, for without whom this event wouldn't have happened, so thank you so much. Two members of the Berkman staff who would have been here otherwise are down with the flu, so that means she did three people's jobs at least today. Um, and, and I think it's great that Jenny and Wendy actually were both called out, because like DPLA, um, chillingeffects.org, which Wendy started and nurtured inside of Berkman. Uh, Creative Commons was started and nurtured inside of the Berkman Center. So many other projects, public radio exchange, uh, podcasting in many respects was invented here. Um, we're really proud of that heritage and, and really glad that the, my, I'm really glad that my first event with my DPLA hat on was here with, with you guys. So thank you to the Berkman and Harvard teams. Um, and the last bit I want to say is I want to also thank our landlord, David Leonard, who's here from Boston Public Library. I think that relationship is one that we're, we're really excited about um, driving forward and strengthening. And I don't just call him my landlord. He's become a good friend and advisor. 
as well. Um, look, I've got a long list of ideas and mandates that came from a lot of you. I noticed, if you notice, Philip was pitching me on ideas, which is something he's used to doing when I had my last job. I love all those ideas. I don't have a checkbook anymore, Philip, but I love this idea of we should be part of a club uh, taking on these larger issues and this, this notion of a participatory platform that, that Maura and Bob and Mary Lee and so many of you others have, have handed to us, I think we take on as a real strong mandate and uh, hope that you all will be part of that journey with us, help to continue to push us and support us in the next five and 10 and 20 years in the long game. So thank you all for coming on a Friday before the Super Bowl weekend. Uh, and uh, I hope you can hang out for a bit and, and chat.